Another example is Ahmed ibn Hamda. Ahmed ibn Hamda will prefer a weak hadith over analogical reasoning, qiyas. He would actually prefer a weak hadith. If he found a weak hadith, he would take that as a ruling before he would use analogical reasoning. Well, the other three imams disagree with that. They say you can't use a weak hadith for a hukum shari. And so they all prefer qiyas because they consider qiyas to be stronger because you're working with a sahih hadith and making qiyas or an ayah and making analogical reasoning. So their methodologies differ. You also have differences in the Arabic language. Imam Malik said uh, in a uh, hadith uh, that came down from the Prophet Sallallahu man, man atba'a sitatan min shawwal فَكَأَنَّهُ صَامَ الدَّهْرَ كُلُّهُ أو كما قال, You know, whoever fasts six days uh, from shawwal, it's as if he fasted the whole year after Ramadan. Well, Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i differed on what that, uh, and Abu uh, Hanifa radiallahu they differed on what that min meant. Because min in the Arabic language can be a partitive, which is min li tab'eeb. Uh, it can be min al ibtida It can be min al bayan uh, There's different types of min in the Arabic language. So for instance, in the Quran it says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ Quran. Well, what does that min there mean? Does it mean ibtida'an min al Quran, Like, أَتَيْتُ min Mecca? I came from Mecca? Or does it mean a portion of the Qur'an, نُنَزِّلُ min al Qur'an تَبْعِيضًا Like, غُضُّ uh, min uh, أَبَصَارِكُمْ What does that min there mean? Is it لِلْبَيَان? Uh, is it لِلْتَبْعِيض? Uh, uh, I mean, th- this is just min. So there's different, and sometimes the ulama differ what it means. So in, in that case, Imam Malik said that min is ibtida'an. Uh, is, is, a, uh, is ibtida'an. It means min beginning in shawal. And so you could fast those six days anytime during the year before the next Ramadan. And you got your, uh, your six days. Because he was saying, Min al-shawal, yani ibtida'an min al-shawal. Whoever fasts beginning with shawal until the next Ramadan. The other imam said, no, that min is lit tab'eeb. It has to be from shawal. In other words, it has to be part of shawal. And, and you can't say one is wrong and the other is right because the Arabic grammar, yahtamil al name. In other words, both meanings are encompassed in, and that's the nature of language. Language can mean there are, there are many possibilities with language. Right? I mean, I can say, um, Omar came today. I can also say, Omar came today? And those are completely different means. But if I read those on a piece of paper, and then Hamza said, Omar came today, and I didn't have some type of adverb to indicate to you, questioningly or shockingly or whatever to let you know. So in the hadith, we don't know sometimes how things were actually said. It's not always clarified and, and things become am- ambiguous. And that's where you get uh, the nature of trying to understand. That's what the imams are doing. They're trying to understand what exactly is being said here. And uh, and Basically, many of them uh, differed, and and uh, and uh, over a period of time, uh, certain imams and the schools that they followed became accepted as uh, canonical or uh, authoritative by the ummah. Now, just to give you an example of Imam Malik, because a lot of people uh, get very confused about certain things. Imam Malik considered it makruh to fast the first six days after the Eid in Shawwal. It's actually makruh in his madhab. Now people say, how could it be makruh when the hadith says, whoever fasts six days, atba' Ramadan bi sitsatin min Shawwal, you follow Ramadan by six days from Shawwal, how could it be makruh? Well, Imam Malik had a principle in his madhab that if he felt that people would think that something was a sunnah mu'akkada or a wajib, he would actually consider it makruh because he had a principle of what was called 
مَخَافَةَ اِعْتِقَادِ الْوُجُوبِ Out of fear that people will believe something is an obligation. Because if you believe something's an obligation that's a sunnah, it's a bid'ah. And so you actually become mubtidah. And he feared for people's understanding in certain things because ignorant people. Uh, things, and people that aren't capable. I mean, somebody came to me and said, Brother, you know, you shouldn't call, tell people to follow Medhab. And then I said, well, I mean, that's what I was taught, that you should follow Medhab. And he said, no, you should tell them to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And then, first of all, that's called Ta'an fi A'immatina. I mean, it's saying that Abu Hanifa didn't follow the Quran and the Sunnah, that Imam Malik didn't follow the Quran and the Sunnah. I mean, it's basically saying that these people weren't following the Quran and the Sunnah. And then it becomes, well, no, 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 they were, but they weren't always right. And I accept that. That's why Abu Hanifa anhu is corrected many times by uh, his students, uh, Shaybani and uh, Abu Yusuf. When I mean, they actually correct, they don't agree with his, uh, their teacher. Uh, there's Madikis that don't agree with Imam Madik from his students. And then you have all these uh, centuries of scholars going over and looking at the Dalils again and again and doing it. So you're not talking about an individual. When you say Maliki or Shafi or Hanafi, it's a school. That's what people don't understand. You're, it's a school of, of a, 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 a large group of scholars that what they're all accepting is the methodology of the school. That's the difference. And the methodologies differ. So, for instance, the methodology of Abu Hanifa anhu is that he will not take uh, solitary transmissions over a principle in his madhab. And that's why even if a hadith is sahih, he will leave it when, when it's overridden by a principle with him. And that's why there is a hadith that says a non-Muslim is not killed uh, for uh, a Muslim is not killed for a non-Muslim. If a if a Muslim kills a non-Muslim, he's not killed for it. He can be punished. He can pay the dia, but he's not actually killed for it. There is a hadith that says that, and that's the position of Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i. Abu Hanifa said that goes against the Quranic principle of musawat in them, and he said I'm not going to take a solitary transmission that goes against uh, a principle. So he considered that if a Muslim killed a non-Muslim, that, and he did it unjustly, that he was killed for that. And that's his, and you can't say that's wrong and the other ones are right because the hadith says that. No, he knew the hadith. But he did not accept a solitary transmission in that case. And there are many examples of that. Another uh, thing is Imam Madik considered the actions of the, the people of Medina, the scholars of Medina, who were tabi'in, he had 900 shiuch Imam Malik. He studied with 900 teachers. 600 of them were tabi'in. He considered, and these are people that met the Sahaba. One of his closest teachers was somebody who spent uh, decades with Ibn Omar. And we know that Abdullah ibn Omar was one of the most rigorous in following or adhering to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Well, Imam Malik took directly from Nafi'a who was the servant of Ibn Umar. He actually served him. So, Imam Malik considered th that the actions of the people of Medina, if they agreed on something, because he was living with people that lived with Sahaba, thousands of people, he considered if they agreed on something, that what would override a sound hadith. So Imam Malik, for instance, there is a hadith that says that the Prophet, it's in Sahih, it's in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet, Naha Rasulullah The Prophet prohibited fasting on Friday. Imam Malik said, I saw all of the virtuous men of the city fasting on Friday. And I'm not going to take a solitary transmission of a hadith that one man narrates and leave what I'm seeing hundreds of scholars in this city doing who lived at, with the Sahaba and they were doing that practice when the Sahaba were alive and the Sahaba didn't tell them don't fast on Friday. So Imam Mata considered Friday a virtuous day to fast. Not because he didn't know the hadith and that's why somebody said, Ya Akhi, Al Hadith. <laughs> and and Imam uh, Imam Malik said, "Kullu qawlun yu'khadu minhu wa yurad illa qawlu sahib al-maqam." Every word is taken from and left except the word of this prophet. 
Imam Malik knew, he said that. He's the one that said that. And yet, he leaves many, many hadiths. Uh, Imam Malik, uh, Ibn al-Qasim said that uh, Ibn al-Wahdin radiallahu said that had it not been for Malik, I would have been destroyed because I memorized so many hadiths until I became confused. And then he said, and then I went to Malik and I would tell him the hadith and he said, Lays al amal ala hadar hadith. That hadith is not, uh, there's no practice in that hadith. And he'd say, khud hadha hadith, da hadha hadith. And he would tell him. And Ibn al Qasim, when he went into the house of Malik, he found stacks of hadith that Malik never related. And he said, Rahimukullah, this was after Imam Malik died. He said, Rahimukullah, Abu Abdullah, Aradullah, the ilmika, you wanted Allah with your knowledge. Because Imam Malik was somebody, somebody once came to him and said, uh, you know, re re recite this hadith to me. And he said, I don't recite that hadith. And the man said, Ibn Uyayna recites it. You know, there's another muhaddith at Malik's time. And Imam Malik said that, um, it's enough to consider a man insane that relates everything he hears. And he wasn't speaking about Ibn Uyayn, he was speaking about himself. That, that he, he related hadith according to what he felt, uh, the, the action was on. Uh, and sometimes he related the hadith to show that he knew the hadith, but still didn't practice it. So people couldn't say, oh, he must not have known the hadith. So he actually relates hadith, that he didn't consider the action to be in accordance with. And so Imam Malik was very focused on action and he would leave solitary transmissions. And what I mean by solitary, in, in the hadith method, methodology, the hadiths are broadly divided into two categories, mutawatir and ahad. Mutawatir is a hadith that, there's a difference of opinion of how many is needed, but generally 10 is, is, is the, uh, the number. Some go as far as 50. But what it means is that in every generation, there are, are at least ten separate chains of transmission. So there had to be ten Sahaba, there had to be ten Tabi'een, and so usually they go exponential. If there's ten Sahaba, there'll be hundreds of Tabi'een that relate it. That's usually the way it works. But the point of the Mutawatir is they say that those ten Sahaba could not have come together and said, let's fabricate a hadith together. Because all of the hadith, the sahaba are considered udul. So maybe, we could say that maybe one sahabi fabricated a hadith, or thought the Prophet ﷺ said something. I mean, even just iftiradan, we could say that. You know, just theoretically. Maybe one sahabi did do that. Um, but, ten sahaba, who are known to be just and upright and had belief in Allah and His Messenger and knew that the Prophet said in a mutawatir hadith that over 50 sahaba relate whoever says a hadith uh, that's fabricated and claims that I said it let him take his seat in the hellfire that hadith is mutawatir so all the sahaba knew that hadith so you cannot say that 10 sahaba are going to risk going to hell by fabricating a hadith so that's considered a mutawatir hadith that hadith is, is very strong. But I'll give you an example of a mutawatir hadith. In, in, in the prayer, it, there's a tawatir that the Prophet ﷺ in each, when he would come out of ruku', he would, uh, do the rafa' al Right? Now that, that is related. And Imam Malik actually relates that. In Imam Malik's madhab, he didn't raise his hand. Because the amal of the people of Medina was not in accordance with that. The, uh, Ibn Abd al-Barr, who actually preferred the position of raising the hands, he actually considered that to be a stronger position. Ibn Abd al-Barr was asked by somebody, why don't you raise your hands in prayer? Because you consider it to be a stronger position. And he said, لا أريد أن أخارف أصحابي في أمر في فيه ساعة. I don't want to go against my peers, meaning the other Maliki ulama, in a matter that has sa'a. It's, it's not really, uh, it's just, it's not a, 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 he didn't consider it 
important enough for him uh, because it's from Hayat to salah It's not like a sunnah, it's from the Hayat. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, if you left it, you don't have to do sehu, something like that. It doesn't have the strength of that. So he just felt that it was better to not go against the majority of people uh, in, in that matter. And that was his, his position. So, um, because they over, because they had principles in their medheb that they considered higher than, than singular narration. See, when you have singular narrations, the probability of error increases. So, for instance, Imam Malik, there's a hadith about the, the qullatain, uh, about the, the khabath, right? La yahmir al khabath, uh, huh? إِذَا بَرَغَ الْمَاءُ قُلَّتَيْنِ um, And in the Shafi'i Madhab, yeah, the Shafi'i Madhab, they take that, right? Imam Malik didn't take that because the Rawi, the Sahabi that narrated that was not from the Fuqaha of the Sahaba. And he considered it that um, if, you know, as long as the water has not changed in one of the three See, for Imam Shafi'i, it had to get to a certain level before you'd consider it pure. Whereas Imam Malik, he said, no, as long as the three basic things didn't change. So he knew the hadith, but he didn't take it because of a, of a illa in the hadith. And that science is a very difficult science in hadith, of determining why hadiths are taken or not. So a hadith can be sound, but it can have weaknesses that, that you don't recognize because you're not at the level of recognizing. Whereas Imam Malik, he, he preferred the position of the people of Medina because that was an ahad hadith and the man that related, there are two men that related, neither of them were considered to be among the fuqaha of the sahaba. Do you see? So he would actually look at the rawi, the hal of the rawi, and there are many examples like that. And so Abu Hanifa radiallahu had a principle of not taking, he would need two uh, sound hadith, isn't that correct, Imam Jamal? He wanted two sound hadith to override a principle, right? Abu Hanifa radiallahu Yeah. So he, he wanted, some, something had to be of the same level. So the only thing that, if you have a Quranic principle, the only thing that's going to override a Quranic principle is a mutawatir hadith amongst the usulis. Because a mutawatir hadith has the same level as the Quran in its strength. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, you have what's called mutaq muqayyid and am al khas. You have in usul, there are hadiths that are mutaq, which means they are applicable and then you have a hadith that only applicable to specific situations. So for instance, there's a hadith uh, about the, you know, khams mushbi'at in the rada'a, which Imam Shafi'i took. So you needed to have a child would have to suck five times and they would be enough that the child didn't want the breast anymore. Uh, Imam Malik didn't take that. He, he said that al-masal wahida is enough. Um, and that was the practice of, of the people. So, there are many examples like that, you know, of, of the, the hadith. And it's not rejecting the hadith. I mean, you can't see it as they're rejecting something the Prophet ﷺ said, hashahum. They would never reject anything the Prophet. Don't think that they're rejecting the Prophet's hadith. But what they're saying is that the hadith is not strong enough for them to leave uh, another proof that they have, even though the proof might not be a hadith. Is it, is it kind of like looking at it as this is parallel to something that's happening in Shafi'i? Like it's not going to be possible. Well, no. The, that the probability of error or the probability... For Imam Malik, what he's saying is the practice that the majority of scholars in Medina are doing, 
they're doing it because that's what they found the Sahaba doing. The Sahaba would not have been doing it had it not been accepted practice because too many of them are doing it. So if he has a hadith in which maybe two or three Sahabi relate it, he's not going to leave the practice for an isolated hadith because he considers that practice to be a stronger proof of what the Prophet ﷺ was teaching. So he's, do you see, he's seeing that as a hadith. The Amr of Ahl al-Madinah has a, has more force than an Ahad hadith. Alright, that, that's what it is. And now, when Imam Sha'i said, إِذَا, إِذَا صَحَ الْحَدِيثِ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي That's true. If the hadith is sound, that's my madhab. But that's within the context of his usul. Uh, Abu Hanifa would agree, but the hadith has to have the strength that he has stipulated before he's going to leave uh, a Quranic principle. Do you see? I mean, it's it's a difference in usul. It's not a difference in in basic understanding. The Prophet, whatever he says, al ain wa ra's. But when we have what's called ta'arud al adilla, you know, when 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 proofs are when you have different uh, understandings, or you have two hadiths that that say the opposite thing, they might have the same rutbah of sahha, the same rank of soundness. The the faqih is going to look and determine what other factors are involved here. The first thing he tries to do is make a tawafuq. He tries to find some way of making them agree with each other. So this one's mutlaq, this one's muqayyid. You know, in, in this hadith it was speaking about a general thing, but here it's a specific circumstance. So he might try to find that. Or he might say, this is abrogated because the Prophet ﷺ said this um, in, in the second year of hijrah, and this one's, he said, in the seventh year of hijrah, and so this abrogates that. There, that that's what he's going to be looking at. He's going to be looking at that. And this, the same is true with uh, the, la- the linguistic aspect of it, of interpreting it from, uh, from language. You know, and I was telling you about that man who said to me, you should be following the Quran and Sunnah. And so I just said to him, look, first of all, the only way you know the Quran is from the Rijal. I don't care what you tell me, the only way that you know that, that Allah said something is because the Quran is mutawatir, transmitted by men and women. That's the only way we know the Quran. And so if, if, I, if I'm ignorant and some person comes up to me and makes up a verse and says it's in the Quran and he speaks very eloquent Arabic and I don't speak Arabic, how do I know that's not in the Quran? I'm not a hafiz, I don't understand Arabic, and this and that. He can just lead me astray. Right? So the way we know the Qur'an is because of the mutawatir transmission of the Qur'an. The hadith, the only way we know the hadith is through men like Imam Madik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Abu Hanif. That's the only way that we know the hadith is men like that. And so then it becomes, you know, who do you follow? I mean, that's basically it. Do you follow your opinion? Do you follow, uh, with all due respect, do you follow the opinion of Sheikh so-and-so uh, living in the 20, 20th or the 21st century or the 15th century hijrah and leave the opinion of, you know, a thousand of the greatest scholars of the ummah? I mean, seriously, that, that's the question. Are you going to follow? I mean, okay, I could write a book, uh, the, the prayer of the prophet as if you see it. Right? And Hamza Yusuf, I get all, I've got all nine collections in my library, and I go through all the hadiths that are in the Sahih, and I try to work out what's, how did the Prophet ﷺ pray? And so I write my little book, and then I put it out, and then there's people who happen to like me. And they'll say, oh, that's, you know, that's Hamza's book on how the Prophet prayed. And then they read it, and then they start praying like that. Now, do I, does that make sense to do that, or to pray? How did Abu Hanifa learn his prayer? Abu Hanifa actually met Sahaba. He met hundreds of ulama from the Tabi'in, and they met hundreds of thousands of Sahaba. They saw them pray. 
I mean, I prayed with Murat al-Hajj for, for, for a, a year. And I can tell you exactly how he prays. Literally, to the, every single detail. I can tell you exactly how he moves his forefinger. Because I watched. I can tell you exactly how he makes wudu. Because I wanted to see how he did it. Right? Now, you don't think Imam Madik, who's living in Medina, with people who lived and served the Sahaba. He's not looking at how they prayed. I mean, so you're looking at somebody who saw Ibn Omar pray and served him for 20 years. And he's your teacher. And you're going to tell me that it's a prayer of somebody writing 1400 years later from books. And he's going to show you how the Prophet ﷺ prayed. Seriously, think about that. I mean, he's going to show you how the Prophet ﷺ, When those people saw people praying who saw the Prophet ﷺ pray. And the Prophet, what did he say? Sallu kama ra'aytumuni. Right. Well, the Imam Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya said in the series of lectures that he gave in, in California, he said it's our belief that the Imams knew all of the hadith that relate to the Ahkam. Uh, and there's only about 500 of them that actually deal with Ahkam. Uh, there's not that many hadith. And these men spent their entire lives. Imam Matik lived 92 years. And he was giving fatwa at the age of 17 in Medina. And he was living at a time when everybody went to Medina during their hajj. So the idea that, I mean, here's a man who collected, who memorized over 100,000 hadith. And Imam Matik would only memorize sound hadith. Even though he had literally uh, hundreds of thousands of hadith in his per personal collection. So the idea that they didn't know those 500 basic hadith of Ahkam is just a total absurdity. It really is. Even though Imam Matik, out of modesty, did say, although Qadr Ayyad challenges the narration, he did say when he was asked by Abu Mansur to make the Muwatta, the official uh, book of the entire Ummah, like the Quran, it would be the Hadith book. And he said, no, the Sahaba spread out and took with them knowledges that might not have come to us. So he was leaving that possibility open and that possibility is there. There might be some Hadith that they didn't know. But the overwhelming majority, they certainly did. And their scholars who came after them did make those corrections and redresses. I mean, there, by the time the great scholars of the Medhabs were working, and I'm talking about in the Shafi'i Medhab, Imam Nawawi, who kind of finishes off the Medhab in terms of just making a complete statement of the Medhab. Imam Nawawi, to say that he didn't know all of the hadith in Ahkam is a total, uh, it's just a lie. I mean, he knew all of the hadith related to Ahkam. And certainly Ibn Abdul Barr in the Madiki Madhab knew all of the hadith. He memorized uh, over a hundred thousand by rote. And he knew all of the hadith of Ahkam. And by that time, Al-Bukhari, all the great uh, collections had been done. By the time people like Qad Ayyad and Ibn Abdul Barr, they, they were the transmitters of those collections. So the idea that they didn't know the hadith, I mean, that's just... These are really um, these modern red herrings that are put out by people that are just dissembling. I don't think they're doing it wittingly, and don't get me wrong. I think a lot of these people are very sincere, but they really don't know uh, the tradition. I'm not saying they're doing it on purpose, but they are ignorant. And their arguments um, are, are very superficial arguments. I mean, that, that, that's... In, in reading them and looking that, at them myself. Very, I mean, there's one argument that's always brought up that they say, وَأَحْمِدِ مِنْ حَنْبَ الْقَانِ مِنْ قِلَّةِ عِلْمَ الْمَرْئِ أَنْ يُقَلِّدَ غَيْرُهُ فِي دِينِهِ 
from the lack of knowledge uh, that a man has in this religion is that he imitates others in his religion. And they use that as this kind of uh, attack on taqlid, and yet that is the very proof of taqlid. And that's what's so strange to me, that, that you can't see that that is exactly why you are muqallid, because you don't have any knowledge. So to, to use that as a proof for not making taqlid is to basically be telling us that you're an alim. And this man who told me to follow the book and the sunnah, I asked him one thing. I said, tell me one thing. When Allah says, Hiya hatta matra al-fajr, about Laylat al-Qadr, what kind of hatta is that? You know, and he just looked at me with a blank stare. And I said, because does that include fajr or is it up to but not including fajr? Because there's two types of hatta in that situation. There's actually 17 types of hatta in Arabic. But in that situation, there's two types. You can say, أَكَلْتُ samaka hatta رَأْسِهَا Oh, أَكَلْتُ samaka hatta رَأْسَهَا And based on what that hatta, is that a hatta in which what follows it is mansub, or is that a hatta in which what follows it is majroor, and it's going to change the meaning. So you tell me. If you know that it's majroor, tell me what it means. Is it هِيَ حَتَّى مَطْرَعِ الْفَجَرْ Including Fajr or up until but not including Fajr. And he couldn't answer that question. I said, that's one harf in the Quran. And you can't tell me what it means. So why should I trust that you can understand what hadith means? I mean, the fa in the Arabic language. There's a lot of types of fa in the Arabic language. I mean, is it like when the Quran says, uh, uh, وَهَجُرُوهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعْ وَضْرِبُوهُمْ right. You tell me what the fa is there, and then what are those wows? Is it wow and nisq? Is it um, wow for هَلْ أَلْوَاعْ يُفِيدُ tartib? I mean, you know, th- these are things that these people don't know. So why, why should I follow uh, the Qur'an and the Sunnah directly and I don't know what the Quran and the Sunnah is actually saying because I don't know Arabic and I don't know Arabic I don't know Arabic at the level of uh, a person who's capable of, of doing ishtihad I mean I can read books and I understand I've studied grammar and, and I, but I don't know if you ask me how many types of hatta I know there's 17 because I've, I've seen what Ibn Hisham and Mughni al-Labib says there's 17 types of hatta. If you ask me now to enumerate them, I can't do it. I could give you maybe four or five different types of hatta in the Arabic language, but all 17, I, I, I can't enumerate them. But if my sheikh was here, Abdullah would Ahmed, he could tell you all 17. And, and I, Murat al-Hajj could, you know, that's just, that's like Fatiha for him. It's not, 